All right, good morning. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? I really agonized over this thing, so I made you know, so that you could actually hear me and I won't break another microphone. That That's kind of the trend. Hey, thanks for being with us today. So I just, I maybe want to say a couple of things. Hey, there we go. Now I'm, now I'm loud. Um, that's the first time I've ever seen those two videos. It's probably the first time that you've seen those two videos. If you're following along in the book, many of the verses that he covered this morning in that video, or those two videos, are not actually in the handbook. But confidence, God has a message for you today. Because I've never seen those videos before, and the verses that he covered this morning are going to be repeated again in, in what I'm going to share later on. So let me pray with us. Let me pray as we uh, as we start. Father, I thank you that you speak. I thank you that you still have a message for us today. That the message for us today is as true now as it was when the words were first recorded for the first time. Thank you that you desire to put your word into us. That we would live out of your word inside us. And that all of the things that we do, not only today, not just during this Sunday morning service, but as we live throughout the week, that what you put into us would come out for the glory of your own name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand for our first song. seated. We got several things going on this morning. Really excited about having you today. Uh, so uh, what a joy it is. Um, it, it's always exciting for me because over the last several sessions of the different books and different things we've done, uh, we've had, uh, Tim has got to do a message uh, between each one of those. And so that's going to be this morning as well. So um, really be intent to listen. It's really neat. Uh, we're talking about, you know, using our gifts and doing different things. And 
And so that's going to be uh, kind of the message today. Um, I get to do uh, your announcements, and I've got a bunch of announcements this morning. And so I want you to uh, watch the screen. Um, several things, there's even some new things on there this morning. Uh, the first slide is uh, Tuesday night Bible study at 6. Uh, men and women are all invited. Uh, men are meeting in the fellowship hall back in the corner, and ladies are meeting in the big room over here. Uh, they said, men, we did a really good job because we were loud, exuberant, and excited about our Bible study uh, because the women could hear. And I said, yeah, praise the Lord. Um, so um, anyway, no, uh, you're invited. If, if uh, you can't come every week, it's okay. Just come when you can. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to fellowship and to grow in your relationship with the Lord. So uh, today is a potluck after church. If you have not planned on coming, we encourage you to stay. There will be uh, plenty for that. Um, the next slide is a 40-day challenge. I encourage you to pray for the person across the street from you. Uh, there are several different things coming up there this week. You would send them a card, just tell them that you're praying for them and uh, you're excited about having them. Uh, I've got some several, uh, a couple different things as we talk about that. Um, this is a uh, thank you that had came to uh, one of the people that had done something for their neighbor on the, on the left. And not ours either. But it says, Dear North Baptist member, I'm so glad that I'm your neighbor to the left. It was a day it was a day brighter when I got the first greeting card. Never knew what was coming next. The snacks were good, the box of groceries made a yummy meal. I shared it with you and another neighbor. It was delicious. Thanks for all the fun. I'm going to keep this ID in mind to share with my church later on. Signed your neighbor on the left. And it was kind of neat, uh, Shelly was talking to our neighbors yesterday, and uh, she was like, oh, the 40 days is over. <laughs> and she said, we'll continue to pray for you. Oh, okay. Um, so, so they were excited about uh, being the neighbor on the left as well. Um, so that's kind of some, some neat things about what has kind of taken place through this. We've got several others. We'll uh, mention a couple more next week as well. Uh, men's retreat, uh, they leave Friday uh, about 11.30-ish. We'll see how all things go. We'll pick up our resident in Pomona on the way so he doesn't have to uh, drive over. Uh, if you don't know what you're taking, don't know what you need, be sure to see me today after church. Um, uh, if you haven't turned your money in, go ahead and do that as well. Uh, it'll be a good time. You'll, you'll appreciate going, and uh, we'll give you a chance to share next Sunday. So... Um, if you're going, you can start thinking about what you want to share. You don't have to, but you get to. Right, Grace? Where's Grace? Yes. Um, next, oh, not, it's a couple weeks away still, but spring ahead. Uh, this is a new slide for you there. Uh, daylight savings time is coming. This is my least favorite day of the year. I like having more sun at the end. I don't like that part of losing an hour of sleep. Uh, those are treasured things. Uh, uh, my, my kids have all grown up, and some of them are having kids now, and they said, we used to hate naps, right? On Sunday afternoon, we would make them take naps. Now they love them. Uh, they're all looking for them and, and uh, appreciate those. And I said, yeah, see? So anyway, don't forget the spring ahead, because if you don't, let's see, it would be, I can't remember how it works. Will you be late for church? Yeah. Uh, you'd be late. Okay. Because you don't want to miss the Passport to Mission that Sunday. I'm excited about that. That's going to be uh, different opportunities for you to see the different missions that North is a part of. Uh, really exciting. we we got some great uh, things going on that day. So, so don't miss. Mark that on your calendar. We also have something new coming in March. Uh, we're going to try this and see how it goes. There's a Monday night all-church potluck at 6 o'clock on March 20th. That'll be way different. I'm, I'm not sure we've ever done that before. So for Baptists, that's really hard to do. The only good thing is it's a potluck. So that means we're going to eat. And, and so really, starting next week, I'm going to have a sign up to see who's coming because uh, if, you know, I don't know how people's schedules work. Uh, but we'd love to have you come. It's just going to be a time of coming and eating and fellowshipping with one another. Uh, if... Um, 
not many come uh, will tell you how good it was and what you missed. Um, we'll just go that way. Anyway, just kind of, we're going to have a sign up to see who can come, so we'll have an idea of, of what might take place. That doesn't mean you're you're locked in. If something comes up and you can't make it, that's that's fine as well. Uh, anyway, we're just going to try this and see how it, how it goes. Uh, the associational meeting is in Iola this year. Uh, March 26th, Sunday night at, at 3.30 begins with snacks. They're good Baptist. We love that. Uh, 4 o'clock, the meeting takes place. Uh, Pastor Jim Skidell is going to be one of the speakers this year talking about the Lighthouse, which is our mission. And uh, a couple different other ones. One of the, I, think, I believe it's one of the uh, collegiate ministries is going to be there as well. Uh, so it'll be a, a neat time of fellowship, neat time to be able to see uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, so we encourage you to, to think about and take part in that. Uh, also then, uh, beginning, uh, we really need to begin in prayer with it. Our Arkansas mission team is coming June 10th through the 17th. Uh, I do have a, a thank you this morning from Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia was part of the mission team last year. We've been praying for her. She just had... Uh, surgery on February 8th. It says, Dear Pastor Kim, Shelley, Ottawa, uh, and Pomona Church family, uh, with gratitude and many thanks for the prayers said on my behalf, the greatest gift you could give me is prayer. Uh, the tumor was removed with robotics, limiting the trauma and recovery time, and the only medication required has been uh, across the counter Tylenol and ibuprofen. Uh, prayer does make a difference. Um, as you have blessed me, may the Lord bless each of you, uh, hoping to return with the Elmdale team to Kansas in June, uh, in, in Christ's love, Cynthia. So she appreciates your prayers and has really said, you know, it's neat to know that there's a bigger family out there that, uh, continues to pray as well. Uh, prayer concerns this morning, um, pray for the Richard Foltz family, uh, which is Christy Mastingale's father, uh, went to be with the Lord. Um, several that came through even yesterday, you saw uh, Fern Hamilton's um, brother-in-law's having, going for a possible surgery uh, in Peru, uh, going to go to Lima on Monday to see how that goes, and uh, the family's just concerned and asked prayer for, for him. Um, Teresa? Had surgery Friday, going okay, feeling okay, good. Continue to pray for recovery and for results and everything for her as well. Um, pray for my unspoken. I'm still excited about that. God's moving in some different ways even than, than what's taking place there. So uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, Jimmy Kelly Reed, continue to pray for them. Uh, both need really prayers for health. And then for her sister, uh, Susan, as well, as she continues to her uh, diagnosis and progress there. Uh, Barbara, which is Greg and Kathy's sister, pray for health. Marjorie, for health. Uh, baby Crew had surgery this week. We do want to continue to pray that, that he would gain weight as well. That was one of the uh, issues with baby Asher, too. As he grew, there were some uh, uh, weight problems there, being able to eat and doing the right things. And so really pray for for them and Scarlett and Maya and Annie uh, just for, for health and strength for them and then their families as well. Uh, Keith had surgery. He moved on me. Uh, Praying for recovery. Uh, continue to keep moving, right? Uh, pray for recovery for, for Keith. Um, been a little bit of a struggle, but uh, God's providing. So uh, continue to lift him up in prayer. Uh, Cora is not here. Pray for health for her. She's doing okay, but um, just didn't feel up to coming this morning. Uh, Bill, the same way. Continue to pray for health for him. Uh, Alan, Cora's nephew, continue to pray for health from uh, recovery from the accident that he had recently. Uh, Robin, a friend of hers for recovery, uh, Tony Michelle, just for continued health, uh, Kevin Patton for strength and direction, uh, George Farrell, which is Sharon's brother-in-law, continue to pray for him with some heart issues, uh, Donna for recovery, doing better, doing better. <clears throat> to get the tape issue, still working on that, okay, so, so pray for that. Uh, continue to pray for Beth, uh, for, for side and for the shots to continue to work and do what uh, they need to do in, in their uh, Jessica at West Virginia for health. Uh, Bonnie, which is Kathy Cadell's sister, uh, continue to pray for her. Uh, she's in the hospital doing some, uh, some dialysis. She's having some issues with that, so uh, she has kidney problems, so pray for uh, health for her. Pray for the mission team as they come in, in June uh, for God's guidance and direction for them as well. 
Uh, pray for those neighbors, uh, just like our neighbor to the left of us uh, has, is struggling with, uh, she's had some health issues, asking prayer for health, and he had done something that, that hurt himself uh, and has spent some time in the ER, so uh, pray for them uh, for health and strength. Uh, of course, neighbors, uh, her children are really needing some prayer for, for health as well. And so with that this morning, uh, if you would join me in prayer. Lord, I thank you this morning for an opportunity to, uh, to gather in your house. Lord, we thank you for opportunities to, uh, to pray, to lift up those around us. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you just as we sung a little bit ago. Man, there is sunshine uh, in the world today. Uh, Lord, it may be cloudy here in Ottawa, but Lord, we know the sun is shining. Uh, Lord, it's a, a beautiful day inside here. I've seen the smiles on so many different faces, Lord, that it's, uh, that it's evident. Uh, that there is joy. And so, Lord, we come this morning with um, several concerns, uh, several um, our family members, some our extended family. Uh, Lord, we pray that your guidance and direction is upon each one. Lord, we come this morning knowing that, uh, that you're in control. Uh, Lord, you already know the outcome of these prayers that are mentioned. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would touch each one of these lives in a way that only you can. Uh, Lord, and, and not that only the individual would see, but that we would be able to see as well. Uh, Lord, help us to give testimony to the Lord, to the world, about, the, about how you provide, how you heal, how you strengthen, how you encourage. So, Lord, we give you praise for this. We thank you in all things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I did one announcement that I held for the end that I can uh, share with you now. Uh, this Friday is, is Harvester's. Uh, the truck will be at the lighthouse about 3 o'clock or so. Distribution is from 4 to 5. The, let me say this. The men, most of the men that help are leaving at about 11.30. So they're going to need some extra strength and help out there this week. So uh, if you can make it, that would be great. I'm, uh, I'll just tell you, uh, the weather's supposed to be 70 and no wind and sunshine uh, okay, probably not, but we can pray that way. <clears throat> it is supposed to be decent, uh, but, but they will need some help because several of the guys that are going to the uh, retreat this weekend are usually part of the staff that, that manage it. Um, so with that this morning, uh, if you would stand, we're going to sing When the Roll is Called Up Yonder.
you may be seated. I don't know about all of you, but I bet you are. I'm excited Amen. that when the roll is called up yonder, I am going to be there. Amen. And I am going to be singing with the angels. Amen. Yahoo! All right, amen. Looking for some different words. <laughs> I, I said that some of that material from today would sound familiar. That's not exactly what I meant. So dismiss the young ones for Children's Church, please. Well, worst case is that you're just going to have to follow along and, you know, Take my word for it and look it up in your own Bibles as I, as I uh, reference verses. I, it's, he's telling me that I break both microphones and video equipment. This is true. Amen to that. So hey, let's go ahead and get started. So just a, a couple of thoughts then. We're working through this, this study of a gospel-shaped life and how the reality of the gospel shapes different aspects of our lives. So where we started, how do we, how do we show the light of the gospel in a dark world? How do we demonstrate the unity of the body when our world is becoming more and more divided around us? How do we demonstrate hearts of service, generosity, when what we see is that the world becomes more selfish and stingy and inwardly focused? How do we demonstrate truth and honesty and sincerity, genuineness, as our world becomes more deceptive and dishonest and superficial and more confused about what truth really is? So today, how do we demonstrate joy in a suffering world? So we need to accept that we live in, and many of us have spent years of our lives actually being shaped by the world system. And, and the world system, just as a definition, that is the way of life which is true all over the globe and is opposed to the way that God's kingdom works. So the verse that we're going to start with is going to highlight this clash of kingdoms. So from Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's Matthew five eleven and 12. So let's pray together. Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can, that we, uh, can go back to the solid rock of your word and, and just rely on what's there that in all of the confusion that surrounds our world, that we have a rock to go back to. Thank you that you have provided for the protection of your word over the years, and thank you for the, the promise that your spirit that dwells in us will lead us into all truth. Thank you for the way that you've provided truth and just that you've invited us to join you in this kingdom which is, is operating contrary to everything that we know. I pray that as we... As we unpack your word this morning, God, I pray that, that it would be your words that people hear. Uh, all of the, the preparation and the study and the materials that I've put together, they just, they don't, they don't really bring about heart change. That needs to come from your spirit, and I pray that your spirit would be active this morning. That as people hear my 
words this morning, that in fact, that it would be your words which take root inside them, and that you would bear fruit from those words to the praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So like most of the statements that Jesus made in the Sermon on the Mount, he describes the economy of the kingdom of heaven in a way that's upside down from our normal experience. So God's kingdom operates in a way that's the opposite of the kingdoms of the world. So he would continue to say, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. Blessed are you who hunger, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. Blessed, woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that's how their ancestors treated the false prophets. That's Luke chapter 6. And he describes again, contrary to what we expect, contrary to what the world teaches, uh, the world system has conditioned all of us to feel natural and to be natural and what we would call, quote, normal. Um, Jesus describes the economy of the kingdom in a way which is upside down or backwards from, from all of that. And so in that same context, then, what we know, demonstrating joy is not going to be natural, necessarily. <clears throat> I would go so far as to say that even people who only know the world system, people who are of the world system, don't actually have the capacity to demonstrate biblical joy. And even those of us who have been purchased out, who have been redeemed, been saved from the world system, we have a number of things that we need to unlearn about how joy and suffering work together. So here is the three-point plan that we're going to unpack today. Maybe. <laughs> and if you don't catch it, I'm going to uh, renew several of these points throughout. So this thing's killing me. I promise I won't mess with this all, all message long. So first of all, Joy is going to be expressed in the opposite way from the way that the kingdoms of the world do it. It's the ex expression. Second, the circumstances that cause us to express joy are going to be backwards from what the world thinks that they should be. And third, suffering with joy creates something later that the world cannot hope for. So that first point then, joy is going to be expressed in a way which is opposite of the way that the world kingdoms do it. The world expects that joy is only expressed outwardly. So with excitement and jubilation and exuberance and acclamation. And I'm going to argue that those are actually not good demonstrations of biblical joy. I, I just, in the interest of full transparency, I... Um, had some members of my family who were helping me choose what I was going to wear today, and, and I caught myself being busted by my own message, <laughs> because I, I said there was a tie that was that was picked out, and I said, "Oh, don't don't pick that tie. I'm going to preach on joy today. That tie is dark. See, that doesn't have anything to do with it. But out of my own mouth, <laughs> oh, that tie is too dark for a message on joy. Well, actually." It might have been a pretty good tie because we're going to talk about joy and suffering together. Joy doesn't have anything to do with the outward expression of jubilation and acclamation and, and uh, happiness. So here's three verses, kind of rapid fire, where we talk about the expression of biblical joy. 2 Corinthians 13.11 Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. This one will be very familiar, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, Paul included all of these statements as part of his closing words to the churches in Corinth and Philippi and Thessalonica. And so in each case, the word rejoice is used as a command. In two of those verses, verses actually, he's explicitly using the word always. So would it make sense 
But Paul is saying that always, as an expression of joy, we should be raising our hands and jumping up and down and shouting with acclamation, with exuberance, all of the time. No. More than that, though, and just that it logically doesn't, doesn't really work. Is that how Jesus is described in the Gospels? No, it's not. That, that doesn't define the way that the Gospel writers... Um, clarified his, his daily activities and his behavior. Was he full of joy? I believe so. Did he express his joy in that way? No. One of the things I think that makes it really difficult to understand this is just our language. And again, just, just being fully transparent, even during this week, while preparing this message, I read in a very good, biblically sound, uh, good foundation, trustworthy Christian book, the word joy used almost interchangeably with the words happiness, pleasure, and satisfaction. See, we've <laughs> coming out of the world system, we can see that the world confuses words like love, like hope, like joy. These things that characterize the Christian experience, when we see those words used within a world context, they've been uh, thrown into a blender and kind of put on puree. And, and that becomes our understanding of these words. So we go back to the Bible to say, what did we actually mean in the first place? See, joy isn't happiness. Joy isn't pleasure or excitement or satisfaction. These are all very nice things, but they're all emotional in nature. And, and if joy can be commanded, as it was when, when Paul wrote those words, joy cannot be emotional in nature. Right? If, it, if it can be commanded, it can't be emotional because emotions are fickle and unreliable and unpredictable and inconsistent. They are a biochemical, physiological response to your brain's interpretation of stimuli. Now, I don't, I don't want to downplay emotions, right? Emotions matter. But the point is, is that emotions can't be commanded because they're extremely unreliable. So we need to differentiate between the feelings that we associate with joy and what it is that we're actually commanded to do. Or maybe said a different way, joy may be accompanied by happy feelings, but it cannot be the happy feelings. So, what is joy then? So in a recent study, we explored spiritual gifts or gifts of grace. Anybody remember the, uh, the Greek word there that's used for, for grace? It's charis. Charis. And actually, the word rejoice, as we see it used in these contexts, it's actually the same root word. So we might define the word rejoice as to delight in grace. Isn't that, isn't that a, a beautiful picture of what Paul's saying in these contexts? He's not saying that we should continually jump up and down and, and shout triumphantly. But instead, the command is to continually delight in God's grace. And even though it's good now that we can see this on the board, even that in itself is not necessarily cause for joy necessarily. See, our outward circumstances uh, don't necessarily generate joy. So if I, can, uh, if I can use an analogy to maybe describe what that looks like, you know, what does that look like in practice? How would we know? Um, how would we know? So an example from human relationships. Um, those of you who are, who are married, can you uh, identify with this? So even when you're not with your spouse, when you consciously think about that person, there's a sense of wonder and of awe that another person would love you in the way that they do. There's a longing to be with that person, desire to reconnect if you're separate, a sense of something missing when you're apart. And depending on the strength of that relationship, consciously thinking of that other person may come with very little effort. It may even feel like it's automatic. I would suggest that that's what delighting in actually looks like. So if, we, if the analogy holds, then what we'd say the effort that's needed to delight in God's grace actually is going to vary based on the strength of that relationship. And that's what we heard in the video this morning. 
So sometimes it may take conscious effort than at other times, but if I can borrow from the words of Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. See, it is a choice whether we consciously exercise the effort of delighting in God's grace. It's not that we try really hard to delight in God's grace. It is just a choice to do or not to do. And, and the command doesn't allow for different types of circumstances to determine whether we do or we do not. The command is the same throughout. And so that brings us then to our second point. Maybe. Which is that the circumstances that cause us to express joy will be backwards from what the world thinks that they should be. So how is that? Well, since the world confuses joy with happiness and pleasure and excitement and satisfaction, then the world will also come to only expect joy in situations that produce those feelings. So, for example, birthdays and weddings and celebrations and parties and vacations and get-togethers with family and friends and holidays and festivals. And you get the idea. See, in the world system, those are the situations that are associated with joy. Those are the situations where joy happens. But remember, biblical joy is demonstrated and commanded consistently. And we're not going to spend all of our time in our lives at those types of events, no matter what kind of freedom we actually have with our schedules. So if everything in our experience was pleasant, this command would be very easy. But the core of the issue is that our experience of life is not always pleasant. So here's how Paul described the circumstances that cause joy. It's the verse on the screen, Philippians 1, 12 and 13, and then 21 at the end. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. For, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now Paul is either a crazy person, or he has a very different perspective on joy than the world does. So, he is in prison as he writes these words. Now as far as we know from biblical context, he is not uh, in a deep dark dungeon with torture devices on the wall and, and you know rats scurrying around him as he sleeps. It's not like that most likely. But he was a prisoner just the same. And he's not ignoring his suffering, so he's not pretending that it doesn't exist. Uh, he's not just you know, referencing all of the good things and then pretending like none of the bad things are there. He actually references these uh, experiences of suffering several times in his letter. And so here is his conclusion as it relates to joy. Philippians chapter 2. Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service... Coming from your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Again, the words used in the, in the sense of a command. So the imagery that he uses here is borrowed from the Old Testament where uh, a lamb was sacrificed in the morning and it was sacrificed in the evening. And along with that, then there is grain offering and there is a drink offering. Now, we don't have to unpack all of, the, all of the visualization there and the symbolism, but the point is that this was part of the regular uh, ceremonial worship in the Old Testament. And so he, he uses this imagery to describe the service and sacrifice of the church in Philippi as the offering, the lamb or the grain offering. And his own suffering is actually the, uh, the cherry on the top, if you will, the drink offering poured out as, a, as an act of worship in the Old Testament. Paul wasn't the only one with this strange perspective on joy. So here are Peter's words. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. See, again, the word is used in the sense of the command. Rejoice. Delight in God's grace. And why? Well, according to your participations in the sufferings of Christ. 
That's what Peter says. And and the word here, you know, this is not a Greek test, but since some of these things have been referenced actually multiple times in the last weeks, um, I, I really need to take advantage of the opportunity. He says, as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, can you guess what the word there is? It's koinoneo. See, we, we talk about the word often, koinonia, describing the fellowship of the believers. To talk about the gathering together, not necessarily physically, although it includes that, um, but the identification of us with one another within the body. That's the word that Peter uses to describe... Whoop, go ahead and back up. That's the word that Peter uses to describe participating and sharing and joining in the sufferings of Christ. So rejoicing, according to Paul and Peter, is not most powerful. <clears throat> Sorry, it's most powerful not when life is good, but when it's hard. And not when we just experience wonderful feelings, but in the midst of painful feelings. And not when we're naturally enjoying life, right, in all of the ways that the world system says that we should. But when we choose joy in situations that we have been conditioned to despise. So how does this even work? See, this is, this is personal. Expressing joy when there's suffering out there, that may be relatively easy in comparison. But suffering isn't just out there, right? Suffering is it's right here. It's right here. <laughs> it's right here. And suffering confronts the core of what we say is true about God. Suffering clashes with what we usually describe in the Christian experience. And if we're honest, for those of us who live in this country, very little about our everyday experience prepares us to suffer well. It, it's just not taught. It's not spoken of. We don't think that way. Again, within the world system, um, people who only know the world system, they don't have the capacity to understand biblical joy, which means we don't have the capacity um, to learn to suffer well. That's not how the world system works. So just for fun, I did a Google search for this phrase, suffering well. Uh, this is not a carefully designed scientific experiment, right? I just wanted to crowdsource a bit, uh, get a feel for what the world system says about suffering. And the top results were all books and articles written from a Christian perspective most of them were from authors and organizations that I already recognized. Those are the people that are talking about suffering well. I also did a search for be happy. Eight and a half billion hits. Results and sources from Wikipedia, YouTube, large newspapers and magazines that you would all recognize if I shared their names, even pop music. Similarly, I did a search for be successful. Similar results. Life hacks, tips and tricks, advice, programs, step-by-step -step plans, all over the place. Finally, I did a search for feel better. Now I get medical advice added in, and everything from getting a good night's sleep to eating more fiber. Now, there's a number of conclusions that we could draw from this, but at least I can say that we as a culture, right, in the world system, we're not very interested in benefiting from the experience of suffering. <laughs> we're much more interested in shortening it and avoiding it and preventing it and minimizing it wherever possible. Or said a different way, we're much more interested in the product than we are the process. No surprise. So what does the Bible say then? I want to build on one key verse as a foundation. <clears throat> so for a point, suffering with joy creates something later that the world system cannot hope for. From Romans chapter 8. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, 
in order that we may also share in his glory. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we will be revealed in us. There's a lot going on in this verse, so we're going to break it apart and, and take it in bites. I was actually thinking as I prepared this, um, this is a little bit like a math problem. So those of you who actually did fairly well in algebra, you're going to follow along really well. For the other 99% of you, <laughs> kind of hang, hang in there with me and we'll, we'll get through this. So Paul uses two if statements as conditions as he's, as he's separating his readers. So the first part is, if we are children, then we are heirs. <clears throat> John begins chapter 3 of his, of his first letter. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Many of you probably memorized that verse. There's also a song by uh, Third Day. So to be a child of God means by definition to be a part of his family. That makes sense, right? To be a child, that's to be part of the family. And to be part of the family is then also to share in the inheritance of his son, Jesus. Now, in the Old Covenant, the way to be a part of God's family was to be born into the lineage or the genealogy of Israel, right? Israel, not, not the political boundary, but Israel, the person, right? Jacob. Under the New Covenant, the way to be a part of God's family is to be spiritually born of the Holy Spirit. And those people who are spiritually born of the Holy Spirit are then heirs. So that's the first if statement. If we are children, then we are heirs. In as we as we read this, you know, every person who's ever picked up a Bible ever and maybe read this verse, then uh, Paul is using this verse to kind of sort through his readers. He says, if we, so if we are children, then we are heirs. Some of his readers won't be. Second part. If indeed we share in his sufferings. Whose sufferings? Christ's sufferings. It's a little bit like reading Dr. Seuss, isn't it? So Paul writes in his letter to Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not all of the people who go on to mission fields will be persecuted. Not all of the people who are famous to us as martyrs will be persecuted. Not the people who live in areas that are hostile to Christianity will be persecuted. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So this is the group that Paul's talking to when he says, in order that we may also share in his glory. He's not talking to those outside the family, and he isn't talking to those who think they're in the family, but have no relationship or connection with Jesus' sufferings. Does that make sense? Both of those if statements have to be answered true before you fit into the category of, then we are heirs and we share in his glory. So what is this glory that people share in? Well, those people that share in his glory, share in the glory of Jesus that he now holds as he has seated at the right hand of the Father. Here's John's words from Revelation. I, I just, I really love this description. I don't think there's actually this verse there. It's, it's fairly long. So from Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 all the way through 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they were saying worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Amen. 
tendency to identify with the sufferings of Christ is no small thing. But to identify with the glory of Christ is infinitely greater. And that's Paul's conclusion as well. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. See, again, Paul is not denying that suffering exists. He's not pretending that it's okay. He's not saying that it's not hard or painful and all other things being equal, we would not go through it. But again, if I can borrow the expression, suffering is by comparison a drop in the bucket compared to the glory that is given to those who share in Jesus' inheritance. That wasn't just Paul who perceived it this way. The author of Hebrews described Jesus' own perspective in this way. I think there actually is a slide on that one. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12.2 Again, as I said earlier, that uh, is not in this book, but it was in, in the video that we talked through this morning. So, this as a conclusion for this third point, Suffering is non-negotiable. You can try and avoid it. I would even say that it is, in some ways it is optional, right? We can get around some suffering if we choose to. But in terms of being a co-heir with Christ, it is equivalent to suffering with Christ. There is no negotiation on that point. That is the economy that God has decided. So you can try and get around it, but in terms of being an heir with Christ, being a part of his inheritance, sharing in his glory at the resurrection, uh, there's no negotiation on that point. And yet suffering is also powerful and incomparable. So the glory to come is worth it. Now why does it have to be this way? Why do we need to share in the sufferings of Jesus? Isn't there another way? So I'm reminded of a teacher that I had in fifth grade and who would say any time that we were experiencing something that was unpleasant. I'll bet some of you know what I'm about to say because you probably had either parents, teachers, or other leaders who told you the same thing. You know what they said? It builds character. It builds character. <laughs> Food on the menu that you don't want to have for lunch? It builds character. <laughs> Pop quiz? Character. Builds character. Dealing with the difficulties of other students, that builds character too. And I hated it. But she was right. But the suffering that's in your current life situation is probably much more serious. In the last week, I've been confronted with the reality of people and family situations that nobody should have to deal with. I've been challenged by medical diagnoses that are heartbreaking. I know of multiple people right now who are making end-of-life decisions for their parents and planning for futures that no longer include their loved ones. I don't know what your current suffering looks like, but I expect that many of you are enduring similar situations, and these situations consume your thoughts and your emotions are all over the place. And when I say suffer and joy in the same sentence, then you either think that I am the cruelest person on earth or possibly the most naive, maybe a combination of the two. So we know that God's primary objective for leaving us on this earth, rather than taking us immediately into heaven as we become his children, is to conform us into the image of his son. Now, his son was prepared for glory through tremendous suffering, far more than we will ever have to endure. But, but why? Why does God work this way? I think we've established pretty clearly that he does work this way, but why does he work in this way? 
I'd, I'd like to borrow a lengthy quote from A.W. Tozer's The Knowledge of the Holy. All God's acts are done in perfect wisdom, first for his own glory and then for the highest good of the greatest number for the longest time. And all his acts are as pure as they are wise and as good as they are wise and pure. Not only could his acts not be better done, a better way to do them could not be imagined. An infinitely wise God must work in a manner not to be improved upon by finite creatures. If you've never read that book, it's actually not that long, uh, but it is heavy, and I don't mean that in the physical sense. It's heavy, and it is deep, and it is hard. Um, but what we see within the world system is an echo of what happened in the garden, where the first thing that Satan ever does to challenge Adam and Eve is to shift God's character. And the essence of the knowledge of the holy is unpacking God's character in a biblically relevant and accurate way. I really recommend that, recommend that book. So the question that we started with then, how do we demonstrate joy in a suffering world? And the core of the answer to that question is in the definition of joy, which is to delight in God's grace. So what do we do with all of this? Well, choose to delight in the grace that he showed in sending his son to the cross so that we could be called children. It's no accident that all of these sentences begin with choose. See, when it comes to deciding how do you respond, what do you do with this, you have a choice. Uh, nobody in this room or anywhere else is going to come and beat you over the head and say, you must do this. But the way that it works is non-negotiable. Choose to delight in the grace that he showed in sending his son to the cross so that we could be called children, second Choose to delight in the grace that he promised in the resurrection to come where we share in the glory of his son. That's that picture that we shared from Revelation. It's powerful. And finally, choose to delight in his character, unchanging, that in his infinite wisdom there could not possibly be a better way, not, not even a better practical way but not a better imaginable way. Those are the, the choices that are ahead of you this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that the expressions of our joy would be pleasing to you. pray that you would give us the power to demonstrate joy in situations that the world just doesn't understand. That as we experience life, we will respond with joy that we choose. And the world will be confounded by it because that's not within their capacity to understand that joy would be exhibited in that way. I pray that in all of this that we would long to better understand your character. Now the what questions may be revealed by your word and the how questions may be revealed by your word. And again, your promise is that your spirit will lead us into all truth. But the questions of why, the questions of why will probably not be answered within this life. 
And the essence of faith is that we would believe in your character, that the character that you've revealed in your word is true and accurate and fully represents who you are. And that in the midst of our suffering that we would that we would take that to the bank. And that that is where we would rest our hope. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand up for our closing song, Victory in Jesus. Think about that picture of Revelation that we, ch- that we shared. There can be no greater victory than that one. Thanks, Tim. That's one of those things where uh, suffering, you don't have to, you get to. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
Uh, yeah, there is victory. Hey, I do want to mention too, uh, uh, praise this morning too, uh, Brad Shoemaker's here. Uh, had some process and procedures, but we're glad to have you this morning and uh, praying for continued recovery and, and praying for uh, our other Brad's process that he's headed towards. So uh, don't forget to lift those guys up in prayer. Uh, we always give you an opportunity to take part in the ministries, whether you are uh, on Facebook and out and about. Uh, we have several of you that watch and join us each Sunday. And uh, uh, you can donate through Generosity by Lifeway app. You can find that on the phone, on your PC, on your tablet. Uh, you can find that on our Facebook page or web page. You can donate that way or you can uh, mail a check to the church, put attention lend on it. Uh, that'll get the same place. Or you can come join us and drop it in the offering plate on a Sunday morning. We'd love to have you in person. Amen? Amen. For all those of you that are here. Yeah, hey. Um, uh, we're going we're gonna to close out here in just a minute. Uh, we're going to sing the chorus to um, their sunshine in my soul today. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to go ahead and pray. Uh, the food will be ready downstairs. Uh, if you haven't planned on staying... Uh, you need to because there's food that needs to be eaten, right? Amen. And uh, it's down there and, and ready, so uh, uh, we're excited about that. I am. I'm a good Baptist, so um, uh, don't forget. Uh, as, as I mentioned towards the end of the announcements and prayer, uh, the harvesters this Friday. I'll send an email out through Emily, but uh, they really will need some help. We've got uh, we got 16 guys going this year, uh, so it's really exciting. I really pray that. Uh, uh, with God's guidance and direction that uh, uh, they're really touched by the Lord and uh, really come back rejuvenated and, and changed. That's the, that's the whole desire. Uh, it'd be neat. Um, John and I kind of watched the numbers. They went from uh, uh, 60 to like 80 to 100, and uh, it's up over 300 now. So uh, there'll be some neat guys uh, there from all over the two-state area. And, and uh, when you get uh, you know, over 300 guys together singing, it sounds really good. Uh, no, no matter how bad we are, uh, when they're all together, it sounds like a chorus of angels. Uh, I'm, I'm serious, it really does sound good. So we are excited to have you today. I'm so hopeful uh, that God will just continue to guide and direct you and your life. And that uh, uh, ho hopefully you'll stay today for the meal to have a time of fellowship as well. Uh, so with that, we're going to sing the chorus to um, their sunshine in my soul. Are we singing it twice or once? or twice. We're singing it twice. And then we'll... Close in prayer and bless the meal. And uh, if you don't know how to get there, you can go down those stairs, uh, circle around, come out. You can go down the elevator. You can get there from everywhere to get there. Uh, but it's set up and ready. All right, let's sing. to you today and uh, lord we are grateful uh, to hear the message that uh, that tim prepared and brought and lord it is one that uh, as we become co-heirs with christ it's uh, co-heirs in in all things and so lord now help us to see that uh, um, suffering and, and tribulations and, and trials in our lives are not always uh the most difficult thing that there is to face because lord we have you that's went before as so Lord, help us to be focused on you uh, during these things, during these times, during these trials, that, Lord, we would see you in the midst. As we just sung that song, that we would see uh, that smiling face. Lord, help us to understand uh, the purpose of the things that goes on within our lives and help us to trust you in it. Lord, we thank you for the food that you've prepared. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the time of fellowship, the, the koinonia that Tim mentioned. Uh, Lord, that we can come together and just, just share uh, from our hearts, from our, from our lives of what's going on. And, and Lord, that uh, so many have, uh, have prepared a portion of this meal today that 
were about to take place and eat of, Lord. We just ask you bless that to our bodies. Uh, bless the time of fellowship, Lord. Help us to continue to stay focused upon you and all that we say and do. Lord, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Again, it's ready. Uh, we encourage you to go down the stairs right here out the door, down the stairs, circle around, go through the line. It's prayed and ready to go.